This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining. Uh, today we have uh, another treat. Uh, this uh, topic and speakers were arranged by Dr. Halkos. And uh, today we have uh, Dr. Divya Gupta, who is uh, the clinical director of the Advanced Heart Failure Transplant Program, one of the largest and the busiest uh, transplant programs in the country. Um, she's also the medical director of Heart and Vascular Service Line. Uh, Divya and I go way back because I, I have known her since she was an undergraduate at Georgia Tech when I was uh, a couple of years ahead of her. Um, so it's been really nice to see how her career has uh, developed and evolved and it's she's really emerged as a, a leader and uh, uh, you know enjoys teaching our residents and fellows uh, she brings high energy and dedication to this program and then uh, Dr. Dineshmand who was uh, introduced a couple of uh, grand rounds ago and I'm really impressed that you're doing two <laughs> in one month we, we we had a flurry of emails back and forth are we sure he's he's doing this twice in a couple of weeks so thank you for that no, we really appreciate it. And I think this is really a great opportunity for us. We're really going to try and do this so that we get to learn from each other. Um, and so I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Gupta. Thank you. Thank you, Pooja, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Uh, so we just wanted to, and I hope it's okay, I'm gonna take my mask off. Um, just wanted to provide an update on our accomplishments, um, and we will end with some celebrations at this presentation uh, for heart failure and transplant uh, and mechanical circulatory support program. So we'll provide an overview uh, of heart failure, the epidemiology, which I'm sure you've seen several times, how to optimize care, looking at uh, our work in decreasing disparities when it comes to providing care uh, within heart failure, uh, recognizing near end stage, end stage heart failure, use of MCS, the Emory experience with the, our growth in temporary and durable uh, mechanical circulatory support, and our experience with heart transplant. Uh, as we all know, uh, heart failure carries a very high morbidity and mortality. There are uh, six and a half, actually over six and a half million people uh, that carry this diagnosis with an incidence of nine or 60,000 annually. The mortality we have documented is 50% at five years with over a million hospital discharges costing almost $31 billion, uh, most of due to those hospitalizations. It is the third most common DRG at Emory Healthcare accounting for over 4,000 encounters in the last fiscal year alone for our system. Now, when we come in contact with our patients that have heart failure, uh, the ones that are a little more savvy and maybe subscribe to Doc Google, they see that the five-year mortality is 50% and any reasonable person is obviously fearful of that. But the thing I really try to hone into our patients is that it depends on how well they manage their disease and how well they feel with it. So the NYHA classification is a very big predictor of what their life will be like. For my patients that are NYHA class one or two who are really managing their disease well, their lifespan is far better than the predicted 50% five-year mortality. It's really an average when we give that. As you can see, those that are class four, definitely a little bit less than 50% at five years. Those that are class one far supersede that. So what can we as clinicians do to help optimize survival for our patients? So there are actually therapies out there that we can provide to make sure patients, specifically with HEFREF, are really managed well and can improve their care and their survival, morbidity and mortality. So these are the four uh, quadruple therapies, we call it the four pillars for heart failure management. And that's the use of an ACE and ARB and ARNI. And honestly, ARNIs are the, uh, are the uh, preferred medication in that classification. The use of beta blockers, such as Coreg, Toprolexel, and Basoprolol. Those would be the only three that we really uh, rely on. MRA, such as spironolactone and aplerinone, and SGLT2 inhibitors, which are dipaglofosin dep and empagliflozin. If anybody else can say that better than I can, I'd be really happy <laughs> to have you say it. Um, but those are the four drugs that we know are crucial in really improving how our patients do in optimizing their survival. 
And so in times past, we used to start these medications in kind of a sequential method, one after the other, sometimes taking over six months to get patients optimized on their meds. The newer convention, which is this rapid sequencing in which we really start small doses of all of these drugs and try to uptitrate them in small but frequent uh, intervals. And so in this case, we try to get them on all four drugs within four weeks, and then we spend the next few weeks, about every week or two, optimizing these meds uh, in order to get the maximal impact that we can from these medications. And so what we can find is that by doing this over a year, and this is a study by Januzzi looking at patients that have HEFREF, they averaged this diagnosis for about 50 years and had been on therapy with an ACE or an ARB and beta blocker. Uh, these patients were then converted from ACE or ARB to ARNI. And what we saw is over the next 12 month period, significant, almost a 10% increase in their ejection fraction. Improvements in morbidity and mortality came with that as well. As you can see, using this more comprehensive therapy, the quadruple therapy, as we call it, we can increase survival by over six years in both uh, overall survival and significant improvements in event-free survival as well. There, because of these impacts that this quadruple therapy provides, there are now uh, preliminary studies looking at the need for ICDs in our populations of patients with HEFREF, since we are seeing such magnificent improvements in their not only clinical picture with regards to ejection fraction, but also how they're feeling and how their survivals are. So there's more to come. Those studies are still in their early stages, but we'll see, I mean, it's very likely a lot of these patients, if put on quadruple therapy with this rapid sequencing in an early format, won't even need ICD therapy long-term. So something that we're also working on at Emory is looking at how do we improve care within the system? And so there's this concept of hospital at home that has been used in a lot of single payer communities, such as England, Canada, Israel, and Australia. And what this provides is initially a patient comes in acutely decompensated with heart failure. They get some initial management, figure out what the IV diuretic dose is that optimizes this patient's uh, ability to diurese in an appropriate fashion. And once that's been determined, the patient is actually discharged home prior to completing that diuretic therapy. And there is a, a provider that then actually comes to the house uh, assesses the patient, gets labs on a regular interval, daily, every other day, whatever seems to be required, and decides if that patient should get another dose of IV diuretic or a different dose. They help continue that care at home. This helps improve, obviously, a patient's length of stay, so it decreases nosocomial issues of infection and other hospital-related complications, obviously also lowering costs. As we said in the beginning, hospitalization is the largest part of that $31 billion to our healthcare system. And so by using this, we have actually, uh, with this concept, we have partnered with uh, a company called Dispatch Health. This is throughout Emory Healthcare, and the details are still in its infancy, but we are using them to help us try to carry out this care at home if we can. And so part of this will be based on the payer that the patient utilizes for their insurance coverage. Uh, those details are still being worked out, but there is a possibility we can have these patients come in, figure out their optimal diuretic dosing, have them actually discharge home to finish out that care. They have a, a, a provider come to their house, assess the patient and fill this gap uh, between discharge and clinical visit while they optimize their care at home. So this is, again, more to come, but something that we are working on uh, at our institution to really help uh, push the needle with regards to providing uh, better care with decreased uh, complications. This moves us on to understanding what are these disparities in heart failure uh, and uh, how, what can we and what are we doing as an institution to, uh, to really make a change? So black patients carry a higher prevalence of this disease uh, and have for quite some time and are, it's appearing to be that way for a very long time. Regardless of age, black men and women tend to also have the higher incidence uh, of this disease process. As you can see, even especially in younger patients, uh, black men and black women have the uh, highest uh, first acute decompensated heart failure event uh, noted. In older uh, patients, black men still carry that burden. Uh, white men have you know, inched up a little bit above black women, but still it, it is a disease that is very prevalent within the black community. 
their mortality is also seen to be much higher. Uh, if you look at the younger patients, black men and black women have higher rates of mortality uh, with HEFREF. Uh, in older patients as well, black men still carry a higher, higher mortality rate. So this is clearly a disease that impacts uh, our black patients far more than it, it seems to impact others. So what can we as an institution do about this? Uh, we have actually taken a very active role in trying to create an equity in how we provide care throughout Emory Healthcare. Uh, and a part of this is very nicely kind of illustrated in a paper by uh, Dr. Khadija Breffitt, who looks at, you know, what are, what are ways, foundations in creating this equity with heart failure management? So partly, a big part of that is removing barriers to heart failure referrals. So we've really worked hard uh, and actually a lot of our fellows are a big part of this. When you go out in the community, you take with you the understanding of what end-stage and near-end-stage heart failure looks like. And when you are in real-world practice, you help identify these patients and send them to us. Uh, a lot of our fellows uh, out in the community have helped do this. And in speaking to one of them, I asked them uh, very interestingly, I was like, look, we're thank you for allowing us to become a part of your patient's care. We've been able to transplant and VAD and provide uh, uh, other art, uh, advanced heart failure uh, therapies, where did you send these patients before? And very seriously, he said, we just used to let them die. And so it is that understanding that you guys take from your education here by understanding and going through our um, rotations that what this looks like so you can help save lives for patients out there uh, when you go into the real world. So thank you for doing that. We're also working to optimize our therapeutic alliances with other organizations uh, such as Wellstar, uh, we're also looking to understand within ourselves and within the community out there, what are some implicit biases and how can we help reframe how we think and how we educate others in thinking about taking care of all of our patients. Also having a very diversified workforce uh, is key. We all bring to the table a little bit different history when we come from very different backgrounds. And that really helps us understand the patients that come to us and different stories they may also have. With this, we have a mission and a vision for our program. And that is to help provide advanced heart failure, heart transplant, durable and temporary mechanical circulatory support options to patients with heart failure referred and cared for at Emory Healthcare, utilize, utilizing shared decision-making to determine the best course of action for each individual in a timely manner and without bias. Individualized options for advanced therapies will be available based on clinical ability for the most successful outcome for survival. So this really is a key to how we function. It's making sure that we understand uh, you know, within ourselves what some of these implicit biases might be. So this really um, was very purposeful and uh, required some education and re-education. Uh, Dr. Alana Morris and Neil Dicker were, were instrumental in helping us first identify, recognize within ourselves and identify what these implicit biases might be. And I'll talk a little bit about um, what we went through with that in a moment. Uh, we also have a multidisciplinary team that works to create opportunities when situations may not be ideal, in which we do have a list of criteria, but instead of seeing these as barriers, as complete hard stops, we see these more as hurdles. And how can we work with our patients to make sure we can work through those to create a more successful environment for their life, whether it be heart transplant, advanced therapies with a durable LVAD or palliative options potentially. And so we've also worked, it's also been an institutional mission, uh, honestly, for Emory Healthcare. Uh, Medicaid in Georgia does not pay for heart transplants. Medicaid pays for kidney transplants, pays for liver transplants, for whatever reason, they've decided not to pay for heart transplants. Interestingly, every surrounding state of Georgia, their Medicaid does pay for heart transplants, just a fun fact. Um, but our institution for over 25 years, and Dr. David Vega will tell you, even since before he started, which I think was what, 25, 26 years ago, Emory has covered the cost for heart transplants for our Medicaid patients. In, a, in an effort to help, again, create this equity so that our underserved patients, underprivileged patients uh, are not you know, held accountable because, they, they, because of our state's inability to cover for Medicaid uh, transplants. Uh, Georgia also has the Georgia Transplant Foundation, which helps patients because, uh, help cover the costs where 
insurance may not uh, fill in all the gaps. Sometimes there's, you know, donuts with medical coverage or hospital bills or clinical bills. And so the Georgia Transplant Foundation will provide dollar for dollar up to $5,000 of support. So if a patient opens an account with them and deposits $5,000, they will provide an, a sub, a, 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 an additional 5,000 so that patients now have $10,000 to cover any costs that may incur that their insurance may not actually fulfill. We're also working to expand our network and influence uh, and a big part of this, uh, the one silver lining in COVID was the expansion of telemedicine. And with that, we've really been able to help cover patients throughout the region, uh, actually mostly in Georgia, I apologize. Uh, we have to get uh, surrounding state licensure uh, and Florida's made it easy. Interestingly, one of the things they did make easy was that you can get a telemedicine license uh, in Florida, so that we have, in order to help provide coverage for these patients on a clinical basis. Uh, we're also working to expand our influence within Hemory Healthcare. Uh, anyone that comes to an Emory Hospital should receive the same care, no matter which Emory Hospital, uh, as long as it has that Emory name. And so we've worked to create clinics at Avalon uh, and at Decatur Hospital so that we can help expand the care that we provide at those uh, facilities. We've also, again, with the, uh, uh, one of the silver linings of COVID, at Johns Creek started virtual consultations uh, in 2020. And with that, we really helped a lot of patients were able to identify end-stage heart failure, transfer them over. Um, and now that virtual, it has its limit. And so we've now started in-person consultation at Johns Creek Hospital, which has been uh, I think quite impactful. And I do think everybody appreciates the help that we are able to provide over there as well. Now that everyone's on Epic at Decatur, we plan on starting um, uh, virtual consults there also. And then as soon as we have enough people, uh, hopefully we have get another hire this year, we will be able to then expand to in-person consultations at Decatur also. We've been working with Grady to provide a pipeline for advanced therapies for their patients for quite some time. And so really working even closer with them to make sure their patients are also not forgotten uh, as we again, expand this network uh, of trying to make sure that we're allowing as many people as possible to understand what their options could be if they choose a path towards uh, survival. So timely referrals is a very key part of this in that making sure, you know, when you see a patient with heart failure, we work to advance their therapies. We're constantly reassessing how they're improving or if they're improving. And so we try to, obviously they come in decompensated, we're trying to diurese them. We continue that decongestion, but then we're also trying to optimize their guideline directed medical therapy as much as possible during that hospitalization uh, and that rapid sequencing as we spoke of earlier. Sometimes these patients stall with their improvement and sometimes they don't improve at all and actually might get worse. Those are really the patients that we are most impactful with because they're the ones that have shown you that they're near end stage or end stage with heart failure and making sure that we address, you know, what, what are the goals this patient might have with their life? And so really finding patients within that golden window. Uh, many times we get a lot of late referrals and these are patients that have multi-organ failure uh, or cardiac cachexia that really isn't responsive to any supplementation. And at that point, it's not that we can't help these patients. It just requires a lot more resources and the outcome may not be as um, great as we would have wanted it. It may take a little bit longer. We can still help them. Really, it would be great if we could find patients within that golden window. So right when they're at the you know, NYJ class three, B or four symptoms, uh, really looking to uh, get patients before it, you know, we're having to potentially use ECMO or other mechanical circulatory support. So how do we identify you know, that golden window? Well, it was nice enough, Dr. Javed Butler, who used to be here at one time, help look at, uh, help write some guidelines with the acronym, I need help. So, I think it's a very helpful tool to look at. And if any one of these is ever encountered when caring for a patient with HEFREF, you really should consider sending them uh, towards uh, advanced heart failure uh, clinic or just consult us in hospital if they're in, in house. So if someone is on IV inotropes or if you've been considering IV inotropes, please call uh, our service. Also, someone is persistently with class three B or four symptoms if they start showing signs of end organ dysfunction, just even in the beginning, before it uh, becomes too far gone, 
uh, someone with the ejection fraction less than 35%. Uh, someone with defibrillator shocks, over one hospitalization within a year uh, would be grounds for looking at uh, someone that might need advanced therapies. Uh, despite your escalating diuretics, they still contain this edema that you just can't get rid of. Having low blood pressures or a high heart rate. And if you're having to down titrate their guideline directed medical therapy, you did a great job. You were able to get them on all four medications. They were maximized on them, but now you're having to actually uh, lower those doses because they're hypotensive. Those are the early signs uh, that someone really is uh, near end stage or end stage with their heart failure. And this is a, a little bit more detailed from that same paper on things to look for. So if you're interested, uh, please feel free to uh, take a look at that. It really is a great reference source of how we do this. And so this is again, looking at our web of influence, uh, if you will. So we have uh, tried to really provide care uh, with our colleagues, from our colleagues at all of these hospitals, at as many of the Emory hospitals as possible. The one hospital we are not at is at Hillendale just yet. Uh, we also are providing uh, advanced therapy care at St. Joe. So this really helps expand where and how we can provide our care. We have a lot of uh, patients that refer from outside hospital and really, again, trying to work with those populations, again, connecting with uh, a lot of those hospitals for, you know, that have uh, especially VAD centers so that they can send us their, uh, their patients that for consideration for transplant if need be. So how do we put this all together? What does this mean for our program on uh, heart transplant and advanced therapy side? Over the last few years, uh, we really have increased our transplant volumes. And again, this shows our ability to bridge those gaps and really try to impact how we provide care throughout the community. We are the largest transplant program in the state. Um, and so if we can't provide care for these patients, a lot of them don't have anywhere to go. Those that do have resources can go to other programs uh, within the Southeast, but no one really wants to leave their home uh, for something like this. So if we can provide that care, which we can, then we should absolutely do that. And that's what we've done over the last few years is really increase uh, how we do this. So we're in this um, clinical year, we're planning to do close to 60, it says 57, just based on the calculations of what we've done the last nine months. Over the last fiscal year, we did 51 transplants. And so uh, in that, uh, we, are the we have the largest cohort of Black transplanted patients compared to any program its size at about 60%. The national average of uh, Black patients that are transplanted is typically about 30%. Uh, Duke probably has about 35% uh, to 40%, if I'm not mistaken, and they fall within the same patient population that we cover. Uh, and so we, we really are working uh, to help our, our uh, close these disparities. Um, this also provides a unique opportunity to help understand why black patients tend to have worse outcomes uh, and improve the care we provide to black transplanted patients. With this, we know that uh, black patients tend to form more donor specific antibodies, which is the body forming antibodies to the donor organ, which over time does impact graft survival and morbidity uh, for those patients. Uh, we have started using an optimized regimen with Belatacip, which is actually created here at Emory, used initially in kidney transplant patients. We are now able to use it in our heart transplant patients, and it is shown to decrease the formation of these donor-specific antibodies, improving the quality of life that our patients have and the longe longevity. Uh, left ventricular assist device is another excellent option for survival for our patients who, for whatever reason, may not be transplant candidates uh, or are too sick to await uh, timing of a heart transplant, which we cannot predict. And so the HeartMate 3 is uh, the only currently FDA approved uh, durable left ventricular assist device, who, which has a two-year survival of 83%, which is very close to that of transplant survival. So as time goes on, our technology has been improving with how we can care for patients that can't get a heart transplant. Uh, this, uh, because it is a mechanical device, does require anticoagulation. Also there is, but there is some reconsideration of that uh, in play and I'll discuss that in a second. Uh, 
There's a drive line uh, that does come out of the abdomen because it needs to be connected to batteries as it is a mechanical device. And there is some infection risk that comes with that. 17% of these patients can develop RV failure. Our ability to detect who those are is not fantastic pre-implant. And so we're still learning. And even if we can't get away from RV failure, really learning how to manage the left ventricular assist device so that we can optimize the patient's care, even if they do have RV failure, uh, has been quite impactful. Obviously, risks of thrombosis, hence the need for anticoagulation. And because of the anticoagulation, we now have risks for bleeding. Our LVAD volumes have gone up uh, significantly over the last few years, in which uh, this year, annualized, we will perform uh, close to 100, or have implanted close to 110 left ventricular assist devices. Uh, LVADs at Emory Healthcare implanted at Emory University Hospital and at Emory uh, St. Joseph's Hospital. Uh, and together we really work again, this is expanding that network of care uh, and providing care on uh, both sides of Atlanta. Uh, also working with uh, some of our friends down in Savannah to potentially open up options for care there as we do have quite a few patients that come from Savannah. Uh, and down south, and that way there would be an ability for patients to receive the care they need without having to travel for hours, uh, potentially even not having to transfer up. So that's still something that we're working on, uh, again, creating alliances with other healthcare systems so that we can improve the care provided throughout the state. Uh, so just to give you a little idea, a big way of how we determine uh, if a patient or how sick a patient is, is what we call intermax scoring. And what this does, it takes NYHA class three and four patients and actually subdivides them into seven different categories in which intermax seven are the least sick patients. And these are patients that have advanced uh, NYHA class three symptoms uh, all the way up to intermax one, which is crash and burn patients. So these are patients uh, that are in critical cardiogenic shock and really honestly have hours to live. Most programs implant LVADs uh, at Intermax 3. So these are patients that are inotrope dependent. Uh, and this is the reason I bring this up. Most of our implants are actually Intermax 1 and 2, uh, meaning the patients that we care for are sicker than those seen in the literature when assessing who is getting an LVAD and how their survival is. Um, but our outcomes are quite fantastic in that First off, we have implanted the large, and please you can correct me if I'm wrong, we've implanted the largest number of HeartMate 3s uh, in the country uh, this year. For the last two years. Um, so we are a, a quite a large program showing you it's not, uh, we, there's a lot of patients that need help. It's making sure we provide you know, the ability for them to get that help. Um, and then the national perioperative mortality rate is about 14%. For us at Emory, it's less than 10%. And again, that is implanting sicker patients. So uh, kudos to our surgical teams. Uh, fantastic. I'll let Monty speak to that more in just a minute. I'll let him talk in a second, I promise. Um, <laughs> and, but uh, we are really helping take care of patients. And again, this wouldn't have to be the case if you know, we get a lot of really late referrals. So that was my point earlier is not that we can't help them. It just requires more resources, but we're still doing, uh, I would say a fantastic job and at trying to help all those that really do want that opportunity. And as we do that, this goes back to the discussion about the education that we had in trying to improve our own understanding on implicit biases. Uh, and again, we did this with Dr. Alana Morris. She provided, uh, helped us uh, provide bias training on race in May of 2019 uh, in creating an impact there. And then we did a multidisciplinary uh, group training. And this was using a uh, online app, uh, or it's actually a website if I'm not mistaken, through Harvard, in which it helps you identify very interestingly uh, what your implicit biases might be. And so first we have to all accept that we have them and then we have to be willing to understand when we see these, where we are, you know, can identify these within ourselves. So it's never a flaw in anyone, it's just understanding so we can make a change in who we are and how we function. There was also some uh, implicit bias training done in April of 2021 uh, with our multidisciplinary team. And as you can see through these, we have been really um, impactful in the care we provide. And I do think this helped us identify how we can 
look through what we might have previously seen as barriers and really impact again in creating those into hurdles and figuring out how to work with our patients uh, to give them an opportunity uh, at life. Oh, and this shows you the orange is actually our African American patients uh, that we implanted, and the numbers have, uh, you know, obviously gone up quite a bit. Uh, the other thing we did is we looked at what were some of the social criteria we were creating barriers uh, of, of uh, you know, on of that we initially, as when this was an earlier known therapy, seemed very appropriate, right? These patients, because early on, really required twenty four seven care in the home; they weren't allowed to drive. But as this has now been a 20 year um, a journey with left ventricular assist devices, we understand how these devices work. Survival is close to that of transplants. So understanding now we don't require 24 seven care for the rest of their lives. They just have to have someone that helps them 24 seven in the first six to eight weeks after uh, that implant post-op so that they can really uh, get the care that they need in the post-op phase. And then they are now allowed to drive once they get surgical clearance with their sternal healing. So a lot of changes have been done. Uh, again, anticoagulation is uh, something that the company does recommend. However, in our experience, and this is a uh, abstract we put together with Wellstar in Northeast Georgia, together we had about eight patients that were without Coumadin therapy for various reasons, whether it's because they had a lot of issues with bleeding. Some of them just didn't want to take their Coumadin uh, for different reasons. All of these patients uh, did well off their Coumadin. So this is something that is being looked at. There was another study done by uh, Mark Slaughter looking at the use of DOACs with uh, LVADs in which he had 40 patients on Coumadin, 40 patients on a DOAC. And the patients on DOAC actually had fewer bleeding issues and did not have any thrombotic risks. So these are studies that people are looking at. Uh, Abbott itself, the maker of HeartMate 3s, uh, put together is, uh, or just completed a study looking at patients not being on aspirin versus being on aspirin. Um, and so that should hopefully be coming out uh, in the near future, the results from that. So there's a lot of look at anticoagulation for these patients. One quick point on this also is Dr. Atia is putting together a randomized clinical trial um, that we'll do here at Emory, um, which will uh, randomize patients to either low target INR or standard target INR um, after LVAD. And we're gonna look at you know our outcomes in that. So the, the more to come on that. And that'll be, I think, you know a pretty impactful uh, clinical trial um, that he's working on now. Okay, I'm now I'm just going to tell some stories because you know, like you learned some stuff with Divya. We're just going to talk about you know some of the other things that we do. You know, there's we currently have um, five uh, surgeons and part of the team. Dr. Josh Chan has recently joined us um, from Cedar Sinai, but we also have you know, Dr. Vega, who started our program, Dr. Miller, who's been a pillar, and Dr. Atia, who's been a, who's been one of the, the biggest workhorses uh, that we're all very familiar with. But so um, we've started looking at different ways that we can try to help our patients. And we've been relatively selective about this. You know, there are some programs that try to do 100% of their cases, sternal sparing. Um, we've, uh, you know, I, we, we personally feel that I think it's a detriment to resident education, and that's part of our mission, and one of our missions is re resident education, and so uh, um, it's a detriment to resident education to do all of these cases, sternal sparing, because it doesn't allow an opportunity for the trainees to get uh, good exposure um, with these surgeries, um, and it doesn't necessarily provide a huge incremental benefit. Um, you know, there was a lot of uh, fervor around, oh, you know, sternal sparing um, LVAD decreases rates of RV failure, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, there was a lot of magical thinking in the surgical community that, well, if, if you don't expose the RV to lights in the OR, that it'll, <laughs> you know, they, they came up with all these, you know, but I think ultimately what it boils down to is that if you open the pericardium at the apex so that you don't have a, a big pump pushing the LV apex to the right and accordioning the RV, then the RV does better. And you know, to me, that logically makes sense, as opposed to the air and light theory. Um, 
And, and, and so we can achieve some of those things through sternotomy. And we've seen that there is actually a decrease um, that way with our uh, RV failure rates. But, you know, there are some patients who are technically challenging and we have um, sternal sparing options for them. Um, historically, uh, with the HVAD, we would do actually off-pump left thoracotomy LV apex to axillary artery implantation. It, was, it would provide nice partial flow um, LVAD, it, I, I would akin it to the world's best ACE inhibitor. You know, it would just kind of provide nice, you know, couple liters a minute of afterload reduction for the LV. And we had a, a group of patients who had hostile mediastinums that benefited primarily from that. Now, without the HVAD, um, the HeartMate 3 has, is a bigger, more unwieldy pump and it doesn't, it's outflow graft is 14 millimeters as opposed to 10 millimeters. It's a lot more difficult to get up to the axillary artery, but we've been able to very successfully do sternal sparing approaches in these more complicated patients. We, we essentially save it for patients who've had multiple median sternotomies and we don't wanna uh, risk injuring the, the RV as we're, as we're going to come in. Um, it seems to, the patients seem to recover faster than they would from a reduced sternotomy um, and they, uh, there, there seems to be significantly less bleeding. Um, we've also really expanded our um, temporary uh, MCS and um, arenas, our Impella 5.5, as well as the uh, VA ECMO volumes have grown. Uh, a lot of this has been on the back of Dr. Atia. Actually, Dr. Atia is the uh, most uh, experienced Impella 5.5 surgeon in the world, which I think is you know, pretty incredible when you think about it. And we've put in more Impella 5.5s than anyone else. Um, the Impella 5.5 is a wholly redesigned pump. Um, you know, uh, I was the biggest Impella hater in the world. Um, you can ask them, uh, they, they would cut, uh, they'd come to me when I was uh, at a different institution and, and I refused to put in this pump because, you know, I was all excited about it. I put in the, the 5.0, and you know it would always hemolyze and wouldn't work. Well, we've actually had great success with this new pump and its redesigned um, uh, uh, implant system, as well as redesigned motor and everything. And so our hemolysis rates have been, uh, ha have gone very low, and our patient survival has improved. So um, similarly, we've expanded into shock and you know utilizing these different therapies for shock. So. ECMO and Impella in particular, um, our shock support volumes, our ECMO volumes and our uh, cardiac uh, ECMO volumes in particular uh, have all uh, been growing considerably over the last few years. And so, you know, while someone may look at the ECMO volume and say, oh, well, this was just COVID, um, when you look at it in greater detail, you see, no, it wasn't actually. So while we did have significant respiratory ECMO growth in COVID, we've also had significant uh, growth in our VA ECMO support and tank care patients. Um, We've all, you know, one of the things that we're able to do now, and, and we do a pretty good job of, is uh, transporting patients from uh, around uh, the state um, with, uh, with ECMO. Now, uh, some of that is transporting patients who have been cannulated locally by the local team. Some of that is transporting patients who've been cannulated locally by our teams. But all of that is essentially our teams will go and transport the patients. The majority of these will be respiratory ECMO because it's kind of it's difficult unless the patient is already um, supported on ECMO to, to get there in safe enough time um, to, to provide VA ECMO support. Uh, and we don't necessarily have a dedicated VA ECMO transport team, although we are we have been able to put together groups, especially for uh, patients who are within our system. Uh, to go there and provide care. So how are we doing? Well, um, our survival to decannulation has been very good. You know, national metrics for VA ECMO survival are around 40%, and we're closer to 60% to survival, which is, I think, fantastic to be able to grow a program yet maintain uh, superior outcomes. Uh, similarly, with uh, respiratory ECMO throughout COVID, we did a really nice job. Um, and in particular, the COVID patients, uh, as we got further along in the pandemic, we got better at taking care of them. Um, what about our Impella experience? Well, we looked at this, and this was uh, some work done by uh, uh, some of the residents who were working with uh, myself and Raja Laskar, and we saw, we looked at a time period of uh, just over a year, about um, 18 months, and in that time period, we had impl implanted 
uh, 98 Impella 5.5s. Um, vast majority of them are in men um, with very long durations of support. Some, you know, some people up to 100 days, which I think is incredible. If you reflect on the days when all we had was the Impella 2.5 or the CP and even the 5.0, I don't think anybody can imagine safely keeping a patient on an impella for a hundred days, um, let alone, you know, um, one day actually. And so how do the people do overall? Well, you know, we see that there's a, there's an initial upfront significant mortality, right? So within a couple of weeks, we lose the vast majority uh, of our deaths happen within that first few weeks, but then survival kind of plateaus. And, you know, that got us interested and say, we'll figure out well, what's going on. What, well, how does that look? Well, what would happen to these patients? Well, um, after a mean of, you know, about three weeks, uh, a quarter of them went on the transplant after a mean of about a month, you know, 20% of them got, sorry, a quarter of them went off to VAD. Um, after a mean of a month, about um, Twenty percent of them got heart transplant after two weeks. A quarter of them got recovered, and then, you know, um, people who are going to die died usually within a few weeks. Um, I think it's interesting because you can, you know, it provides a little bit of a stepwise fashion. You can put somebody on support, um, put an impella in them. If they're going to recover, they'll recover within a couple of weeks. If they don't recover, then you have, you know, you got to figure out why well, are they tolerating the therapy. If they're tolerating the therapy then you keep them on support until transplant. If they're not tolerating the therapy, they need more support, then you pull the trigger out an LVAD. And, and you know, this has kind of been our strategy and it bears out in the data that that's, you know, that's what's happening to these people. And I want you to understand that um, the patients who are putting on support, it's not, you know, these are patients with pretest probability of death within the next day of eight, you know, 80, 90%. So the fact that we're able to survive 80% of these patients through various different means, I think is, is quite a, a testament to the hard work of the team. So interestingly, so of the patients, so you may get to what happens to patients who get their impellas removed, right? So this is the all comers, they didn't die with an impella in place and they live to either transplant, VAD or recovery. How do they do? Well, they seem to do okay. They have, um, you know, we have a 20% one year survival. Uh, granted, there's still some people who are waiting on, we're waiting on completing that follow up and everything like that. But in general, we return them to an advanced heart failure survival curve uh, as opposed to a, to, a, to a treated advanced heart failure survival curve as opposed to the original NYHA curves you saw back there. Essentially, we take them from a Intermax one survival curve to a NYHA one survival curve, if that makes sense. And then we're doing some other interesting things. We have percutaneous uh, uh, RV support devices. Um, our preference is to use the Protect Duo cannula for that. This is a uh, dual lumen cannula that uh, comes in from either the right IJ or the left subclavian veins. Um, it has a sucking port in the right atrium and a, and a pushing port in the, um, in the PA. Um, this is not an ideal device. It's, uh, it's the best that we have. It's better than the Impella RP, which we try not to use uh, at Emory. We don't seem to have had any good success with that device. One of the major dif difficult difficulties you'll see with this device are, well, you see it's kind of going through the tricuspid valve and going through the pulmonic valve, and we get insufficiency with both of these. We've not had very good uh, luck with this device in the post-cardiotomy setting. There's something about um, the... A uh, patient who's uh, got bad heart failure, had maybe has a dilated RV where the device doesn't really stabilize very well uh, in that situation. But in acute RV failure and in the um, RV failure secondary to respiratory failure, we've had really great success with the Protect Duo. And so um, some of our COVID patients, some of our ARDS patients who are progressing towards uh, end stage lung failure and get. Um, uh, 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 pulmonary hypertension resulting in uh, core pulmonale. Well, those patients do really well with this device, and it seems to have a lot less uh, regurgitation around the pulmonic valve and a lot less recirculation. And so, um, uh, something to keep in the back of our minds. I think um, in our surgical patients, our experience has been a lot better with uh, with open uh, cannulation um, surgically. Um, and then finally, one of the, I think, biggest changes that we've made uh, is 
advocating and pushing for ambulation. And this really has taken a huge team approach, but taking these patients who may have an LVAD and an RVAD and, ha and getting them up and moving them around and getting them to, to start their recovery early in anticipation of getting them out of the hospital at some point uh, has been very fruitful. It takes a lot of people, you know, this, take a look here. So you have a respiratory therapist managing the nitric. You have a perfusionist managing the pumps. This person has an impella in and an RVAD. You have a nurse who's managing all their drips. They may be on epinephrine and norepinephrine and vasopressin. You have a second nurse who's making sure that the the IV poles are coming. You have a physical therapist who's watching their gait and trying to help them. You have a behind that a physical a second physical therapist who's making sure that they don't fall. You have somebody bringing a chair behind them, you know, and it's a it's a it's a circus in North Carolina. We call it a goat rodeo. Um, you know, I don't know if they have that expression here in Georgia or not, but um, but it works, and you know, it really helps to get these patients stronger, get them moving around, helps with the sympathetic dysfunction. We've been very proud of all the efforts that have put them. This is an initiative that was really pushed forward by the, by the team in 5e um, across the board, all the different uh, players in 5e. And finally, you know, we're trying to work um, to expand the availability of organs. And, you know, what's really been impactful for our program uh, has been uh, growing in the uh, extended criteria donors and donation after circulatory death. And we've been using, um, you know, the system that we have available to us, which is the Transmedics Organ Care System. Um, that is a ex vivo perfusion of the heart. There's actually a second device now um, that's being made by ex vivo, uh, who's going into clinical trials this year. Uh, and uh, we are getting our site qualification qualification visit in a couple of weeks uh, to be uh, one of the primary sites uh, for that uh, device as well. So, you know, finally getting some competition in this space in ex vivo heart perfusion. Uh, that's going to start with brain dead donors, extended criteria brain dead donors initially, um, and then hopefully expand to donation after circulatory death. Donation after circulatory death has been a big part of our program, um, representing uh, up to 20% of our transplants. Um, and it's a, both of these things are a, a huge undertaking. It's two surgeons, perf two perfusionists, and a whole team that go out to do this. Um, we've been utilizing either a combination of our staff or contract work with the actual company to get this stuff pushed forward. And it's been uh, very fruitful. And all of our patients who've had uh, DCD hearts have done very well. So, um, we're also trying to expand options for our uh, patients who might need additional, you know, therapies outside of just heart transplant. While we are a very busy heart kidney program, um, we are working closely with our uh, liver team to expand and, and revisit um, heart liver in selected cases. Um, both of these are kind of greater than the sum of their parts. And then, you know, the lung surgeons are notoriously difficult to work with, but, um, you know, we're, we're negotiating with them to see if we can get a, a heart lung transplant uh, program started. Um, so I'm going to pass it back to Divya to talk about some of our celebrations. So it's been a, a quite a year for our program, uh, a year or two, I would say. So Emory did its first heart transplant in 1985. Uh, in May of 2021, we did our 1,000th heart transplant. Uh, and although he would uh, never tell you because he's as humble as he could be, uh, Dr. David Vega did over half of those 1,000 heart transplants. He's done over 500 of them um, during his time here. And so this was definitely a, a huge success story. And as I stated earlier, we are the only program uh, in the state to have achieved that, uh, making us the largest transplant program in the area. Another big success for us that uh, we celebrated just a few months ago uh, was we implanted our 500th continuous flow uh, left ventricular assist device. So uh, I believe the first uh, left ventricular assist system was implanted in 1988. I don't know, Andy, if you're able to recall and correct me if you can. I don't know. I think that sounds about right. And then our first durable LVAD was implanted in 2004, if I remember correctly. 
Uh, and so this has definitely been quite a journey with our 500th uh, left and trigger assist device coming in. So definitely some, uh, some things to celebrate uh, just in the past year. And this, with this, as I stated, our goal is to really decrease those disparities in care and provide options uh, for our patients. Uh, our motto is saving lives and providing hope. And that's really what we continue to plan on doing with our goals for 2027 being uh, 180 LVET implants for our system and 120 transplants. So we're almost halfway there with our heart transplants and we're uh, much closer than that with our uh, left and right assist device implants. Uh, so again, uh, we have much more work ahead of us, but definitely a goal that we can accomplish. Just a quick comment about that. Well, those are just not numbers that we said, hey, it'd be nice to do. You know, we thought about, we were very thoughtful about, you know, what is our catchment area? What are the number of patients with heart failure? And we think the number of, you know, around 300 patients a year getting, you know, some sort of advanced heart failure therapy, you know, is, is the right number um, for, for, the, for the community that we serve. Um, and then that breakdown is essentially based on what we think we could potentially maximize our organ availability. But we could be wrong. We're wrong as well. We're never wrong. <laughs> With that, uh, thank you guys so much for joining us this morning. Uh, are there any questions? I'll go to the chat. How can we extend this equitable advanced heart failure care to patients at Grady? I've been trying for a very long time, Mole. <laughs> uh, we can talk offline if you'd like. <laughs> but that's definitely something I've been working with uh, Onyuanye and Alan Dollar in trying to make sure that uh, I've definitely also had close relationships <coughs> with, I know I've gotten a lot of referrals from the APPs and the heart failure clinic at Grady, uh, but definitely something keeping open communications is key to a big part of that. So that is something we're working on. Definitely more to come. There are two ways to answer. Yes. I don't know how to do this. Do you have recommendations for gen stars and quick titration? Initiation of What's the answer? So there's a question by Rebecca. How to, so really it's, we start small doses. Rebecca, do you have recommendations for gen cards and quick titration initiation of GDMT? So as I say, we try to start small doses of each of these four medications, typically starting with, uh, we start with, I typically start with MRAs and SGLT2 inhibitors, unless the patient is gonna have some sort of procedure during that hospitalization. Uh, then I will wait until they're discharged to start the SGLT2 inhibitor. And then really trying to, in again, small incremental doses, really try to uptitrate those. Sometimes I'll even use uh, not very conventional methods because a little bit of these medicines even is better than none of these medicines. So sometimes if someone has issues with hypotension, I might even just try half a tablet of Entresto only at night to start with. Uh, if they're going to be a little bit hypotensive, they're at least not walking around getting dizzy because typically they're sleeping at night. And then every few weeks, I'll have them increase by half a tablet, as unconventional as that is. Interestingly, it tends to work. And again, a little bit of these medicines is better than none on board. Um, and so I have had uh, success with these very different sort of methods of initiation and titration. Now, how do I do the hands? Matt Topol and Mike Hopkins. Then do that. Yeah. Matt, I've unmuted. Did I unmute him? Yeah, sorry. I that was a mistake on the hand raising. I, I enjoyed the talk though. It was great. Thanks. <laughs> hey Divi, I can ask without you calling on me. Ask away. So Monty, can you give us an estimate? Um, you know, if you look at the the way things have changed. So currently you have the regular donor selection for heart transplant, but you already have, and probably will have more of the DCD option, the ex vivo perfusion options, uh, which will extend the donor pool, you know, beyond the usual distances. You know, what's the potential uh, for transplantation here you know, understanding there is a cap on the number of donors, even nationally. So there's only so many that will do. But what what's a realistic expectation given those things down the on the horizon? 
Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we spent some time looking at this uh, as part of the um, five-year strategic plan for the transplant center and looking at our current referral patterns, looking at how many patients, you know, are within our system um, and our ability, you know, forgetting for a second what would be our capacity and ability to house those patients in a hospital. Um, you know, we think that we can probably achieve somewhere between 100 and 120 heart transplants um, with, you know, for, for the system. Now, there's a lot of things that need to come into play for that. Um, to be able to do that, we would need to really flex up on, given the current system, our inpatient, high status patients, and, you know, we would need to really put a lot of efforts into being aggressive on um, donor selection and, and, and going out and looking at DCD donors who are far away, and that takes time, money, and effort. And so there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be built to achieve that goal. But just looking at the population of patients, our current referral patterns, I think our, our, our thought is somewhere between 100 and 120 patients. Okay, thanks. Andy. So just uh, compliments to the leadership uh, in these numbers. And obviously there's a lot of institutional support that came into play to make this happen. The opening of an additional cardiac in intensive care unit, um, additional surgical support teams. Um, it takes a tremendous amount of, of institutional support. Um, you know, there was the concept that as the LVADs got better, that every hospital was gonna be putting them in. And that doesn't really seem to be happening. And um, I think part of that is that in order to get patients through these things, it still requires a lot of being able to deal with your early complications. And um, the, the ability to do ECMO if needed or, or other, other things. But Monica, if, if you would want to comment on that, do you think we're going to see every hospital doing LVADs in the future, or is is this more going to be um, in, in in specific centers? Yeah, I mean, I think you know one of the things is I remember thinking, oh, okay, well, everyone's going to be doing this, right? It should be easy. Um, ultimately, LVAD is a labor of love, and it's you know the easiest part of the LVAD is putting the pump in. Um, there's so much. Even actually, to be perfectly frank, the easiest part is the initial surgical, you know, index hospitalization. As you know, better, there's so much effort that gets put in before and afterwards to keep these patients alive and have good outcomes. You know, our VAD coordinators are working so hard to deal with social issues, to deal with medication, to deal with you know, driveline infections, to deal with all this stuff. I, I don't think in the short term, in the next five to 10 years, we're going to be seeing a huge uptick in implanting centers. Now, there are technologies that are coming down the pipeline, totally implantable LVADs, LVADs that are smaller. You know, maybe if we got to a situation where, you know, we had a safe device that we could put in and somebody who's NYHA three and is not, you know, their RV is fine and, you know, they didn't need anticoagulation and it was like a, you know, defibrillator, you put it in and forget about it, maybe. But I don't see that happening in the next 10 to 15 years, given the current, you know, production timelines for LVADs, maybe 20 years. I mean, I don't know. Uh, so I, I don't think so. And, you know, having worked with a bunch of these startup programs, they realized quickly that, you know, this was a lot more than we bargained for. You know, um, our, you know, our partners at Wallstar have done a phenomenal job, but I do think that they're working a lot harder than they thought they would for, for the, you know, for this product. And, you know, one of the nice things about our program is that with this volume, we really have a hugely trained system. And so the pain comes down. And in my mind, I think that inflection points around 50 cases a year, you know, everybody knows how to do a ramp study. Everybody knows if someone's RV is failing, everybody knows, you know, how to manage the, the, the Centrum mag. And, you know, when you're doing 10 cases a year, the number of phone calls you get at night is exponentially greater than when you're doing 
50 cases a year, even if your patients are sicker. And I think we've shown that we've grown, we're taking care of sicker patients, but we're doing, you know, much, you know, very good outcomes. And all of that, I think is a true volume relationship. And it's hard to get over that hump. Um, it takes a lot of effort. And I think that's going to be the biggest barrier. And I, I would just comment that this growth has taken place during staffing shortages, COVID, a variety of things. And, and I think the both of you have done a great job in getting everybody focused on the patients and working together and just this can-do attitude has, has uh, really made this possible. I think that's a really good important point is that the there or our teams are understaffed and they're working twice as hard and it's just you know we have we had a very you know we had a period of time where we were very thin on VAD we're now going to a period of time where we're very thin on heart transplant and we're working on recruitment and you know we couldn't do this without all the support staff and I'm not going to list them because in the, invariably when you list you forget somebody not because they're not important, but because you just, it's hard to go through a list, but there is hundreds of people. All of them are incredibly important to make one patient survive. Thank you. That was fantastic. And for those of you who are here and online, don't forget to get your CME credit. I just uh, used the link and it works. So, uh, but thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.